So we're going to continue the PowerPoint, uh, finish it up on this recording. So last class, we got through a whole bunch of the immune system, really looking at the two big branches of the adaptive immune system, the humoral branch that has its B cells or B lymphocytes, and it makes or it get act, gets activated, makes plasma cells, turns up antibodies, lots of different ways that antibodies can get rid of pathogens. But today we're going to talk about the other branch of the adaptive immune system, the cell-mediated branch. The cell-mediated branch has its own type of lymphocyte, the T lymphocytes or T cells, and it gets the T from where these cells mature. Um, although the lymphocytes are produced in the red bone marrow, they, aren't, they don't mature there. They mature in the thymus, there's where we get their T for our T cells. These particular cells, they like to float around. Um, and hang out in the blood and the lymph. They really like to hang out mostly in the lymphatic system and like to hang out in higher concentrations in lymph nodes, the spleen, uh, in the Peyer's patches. That's that mucosa associated lymphatic tissue um, in our digestive tract. And these cells are specifically looking to attack anything that gets inside of our cells. So these are ones that are looking to fight off intracellular pathogens. And, I'm like, and we have T cells that are specific for about 10 billion different types of intracellular pathogens. They can recognize a lot of different things that may get inside of our cells. Now, this is just showing that there are more than one type of T cell. I'm like, B cells, there's just one type of B cell. T cells, we get three different types of T cells. And it really depends on what MHC antigen they can, I was gonna say it, Mike, that they can recognize that triggers them. Now, my little recall on what's an MHC antigen? And I'm like, it's that major histability complex antigen. There's a class one and there's a class two. These are found on our body cells. I'm like that's the compatibility with different cells. Now, class one antigens are found on all nucleated cells, and class two antigens are found on antigen presenting cells. These are macrophages, dendritic cells that are found um, in our skin. And I'm like, but it's one of these types of antigens that triggers the making of the type of T cell. Now, if a lymphocyte is presented with a class one MHC antigen, this is what's gonna activate our cytotoxic T cells. And I'm like, sometimes we just have a big T with a little C after it for cytotoxic T cells. If, you are, if we have an antigen presenting cell that also has a class two MHC protein on it, then it's gonna activate the T cells that are either gonna become memory or regulatory T cells. And so I'm like, we have got two types of antigen, two divisions here, but even in this one division, it becomes one or the other. Now, sometimes the, the T cells, the cytotoxic T cells are also called CD8. I want to, I don't know where the eight comes from, but the eight recognizes the one, and I'm like, I recognize that class one. The CD8, or the CD4 cells recognize class two. So sometimes you see CD4 cells, it's really talking about either your helper T cells or regulatory T cells, they recognize class two. If you see CD8, and I'm like, it recognizes the class one, and they're gonna become these cytotoxic cells. Now I'll come back to this diagram too as we start talking about how they get activated in the various steps. But T cells, just like B cells, do have T cell receptors. Different shapes though, B cell receptors look like the Ys that have the arms that can bind on to epitopes and antigens, um, activated it, make antibodies, and so on. T cells have T cell receptors, but they don't have arms. And I'm like, they kind of just look like the body without the arm. They can still bind to an antigen. Difference though is, is they cannot bind to the actual pathogen itself, whereas B cells can. And I'm like, instead, it has to bind to an antigen or an epitope that's associated with one of these MHC proteins. So here's a T cell, and it has a T cell receptor. There's your T cell receptor, but it can't bind to the virus itself, mostly because the virus is inside of the cell. 
And so it has to be presented with a viral epitope. This is a small structure from that virus. So here we have an infected body cell and there's the virus inside of it. It's kind of a greenish color virus. It will present various particles on the outside of the cell so that this cell can recognize that this is not just a normal body cell. This is an infected body cell because it can't see inside the cell. But some of these viral particles will present themselves on one of our normal body cells, MHC1 proteins, because every cell in our body that has a nucleus has an MHC1 protein. And it presents these viral epitopes. It presents these structures to our lymphatic system to recognize. And so a T cell can bind to an epitope as long as, you know, an antigen, as long as it's attached to one of these MHC1 proteins, meaning it's attached to a cell that's infected. And so I'm like, it doesn't work on just, you know, it can't bind to that virus inside of there, but it can bind to a viral epitope that is bound, that's attached to that infected cell. So it binds a little bit different and they look a little bit different. Now, as I said before, there are three different types of T cells. The cytotoxic T cells, sometimes called the CD8 cells. Yes, a lot of times it has the big T with a little C for cytotoxic cells. Their main job is to kill cells directly. And I'm like, they're really looking for those cells that are infected with viruses. And they can also recognize and kill abnormal cancer cells, so cells that are undergoing um, continuous division. The helper T cells, one of the CD4 cells, it helps monitor B cells and it helps monitor cytotoxic cells. And so we'll get how it helps these B cells in a little bit. But sometimes the T cells get a little crazy and it just kind of helps monitor um, their production, how many there are, because we don't want too many or it might actually start to uh, kill uninfected cells. And then our regulatory T lymphocytes repress our adaptive immune response meaning it keeps those cytotoxic cells in our immune system from trying to fight off uninfected cells or anything normal in the body. We need to be able to recognize normal uninfected cells and keep them alive while targeting infected cells and killing those. And sometimes our immune system can get a little crazy, and so we have these regulatory T cells that keep our immune system in check. People that have autoimmune disorders, where literally their immune system is attacking, attacking parts of their body, it usually is because of these regulatory T cells are not keeping that immune system in check, and it gets a little crazy and starts causing damage. So we've got B cells we've talked about, we've got different types of T cells, and yes, regulatory T cells uh, are also called CD4 cells. And I'm like, and so again, this is just showing that you have your CD8, it'll become a cytotoxic cell. CD4, it's either going to become a helper T cell or a regulatory T cell. Mike, but we've got all these different types of cells, and they have to be able to talk to each other. And so that's where we have these cytokines. And I'm like, it's proteins that are used for chatting. It's so that one cell can talk to another cell. So it's the intercellular signaling. Different types of white blood cells produce their own type of cytokines, but it's the way they can communicate with each other. Interleukins is um, like a very common protein. It's just signaling or talking among many of the white blood cells. A lot of times you'll see it abbreviated even on some of my diagrams, IL for interleukins. Interferons, we talked about already because they're actually part of our second line of defense. The, but they, these are proteins that are secreted um, to stop viruses from reproducing and traveling from one cell to another. If you remember, this is the cells that if you have a virally infected cell, that unfortunately that cell is going to end up dying. But before it does, it sends these interferon proteins to all the neighboring cells. We're warning them to arm themselves that there's viruses around to hopefully save those. So these are these antiviral proteins. Growth factors are proteins that are going to stimulate leukocyte production. I'm like that, yes, sometimes we need to make sure we have enough white blood cells, especially if we're mounting an immune response. We're going to want more white blood cells to get formed. Then we have a tumor necrosis, fa tumor necrosis factor. Uh, various macrophages and T cells secrete these. They try to help kill tumor cells, kind of help regulate our immune response, um, killing abnormal cells. 
And then chemokines are signals. Um, these signal white blood cells to move. That's supposed to be an S, not a C. These signal white blood cells to move, usually toward an infection, usually toward inflammation. Anything um, chemo as a chemical can mean movement, some type of movement. So these are causing white blood cells to move. Now, Mike, so that we have white blood cells going to the infection before that infection can travel. So we've got our kind of players in the game. Now, Mike, so we kind of know all our players. We know the stage. We know it's all the immune system, the lymphatic system. We've got different types of uh, lymphocytes, T cell, various types of T cells, B cells. We've got the humoral branch. We've got that cellular mediated branch. Now, for kind of how it all works. And now, Mike, because we're going to talk about that cell mediated immune response and then how the two branches actually chat with each other. So the cell-mediated branch responds to any type of intracellular pathogen, uh, as well as any other abnormal body cells. And again, these are the cells, and I'm like, that recognize some type of intracellular pathogen. So whether it's a virus and it has to attach to the epitope on an MHC protein. So the most common intracellular pathogen by far are viruses. Although that's not the only thing that it's effective against. And I'm like, again, it's effective or response to abnormal body cells, so cancerous cells, as well as intracellular protozoa, intracellular bacteria. Mike, if you're an organism that wants to live in our bodies, if you can get inside of our cells and live there, you kind of hide yourself from the immune system. Unfortunately for them and fortunately for us, and I'm like, our immune system can kind of recognize them. This isn't actually showing one of our white, or just one of our cells that's infected with the bacteria. And so there are some bacteria that are intracellular. There are some protozoan, there are some fungi that are intracellular organisms. And I'm like, and so we've got these T cells that can recognize it because they will somehow present some type of uh, outside epitope. Now, to activate cytotoxic T cells and to also uh, differentiate so that we end up having some of our helper T cells. It's a four-step process. And I'm like, one, we first have to get presented with an antigen, whether it's that MHC1 on all nucleated cells or an MHC2 on antigen-presenting cells. This is den a dendritic cell, that's the DC, and I'm like, which is an antigen-presenting cell. So it does have that MHC2. And so first, we're going to be presented with an antigen. Is it an MHC1? Is it an MHC2? Is it both in this case? If it has that MHC2, this is what's going to trigger our CD4 cells, and we're going to start to have T helper cells differentiate. And so we'll start to have some of these type of cells. And I'm like, if it also has that MHC1, which all nucleated cells do, this is where we're going to start to activate the cytotoxic T cell. Once activated, once it sees this MHC1 antigen, it will bind to it, it's binding over here, activate it, and it starts to make more of itself. It starts to make more of these activated cytotoxic cells. Now, one of the activated cytotoxic cells, and I'm like, can become memory cells. And so I'm like, we start to get memory cells during this clonal expansion. If it doesn't become a memory T cell, it just constantly tries to make more and more of itself. It's called self-stimulation. So we have a whole bunch of these active cytotoxic cells whose main job is to go around and kill cells. And I'm like, their nickname are the natural killer cells. And I'm like, most of the way they try to kill is through apoptosis. They go up to infected cells. They try to encourage those cells to kill themselves. Sometimes they can create toxins to kill infected cells but they really want to destroy infected cells. And so I'm like, this again is showing it in just a different diagram. And I'm like, if you have that MHC1 antigen, we're going to activate cytotoxic cells. We have the clonal expansion, including some memory cells. And then we have self-stimulation, making lots and lots of copies of yourself. If we were on the other branch, if we had that C the class 2 antigen, and I'm like, we're going to activate CD4 cells. They'll also undergo their own clonal expansion, making memory cells. And then they're going to either become a helper T cell or a helper regulatory cell. Just depends on what we think our body needs at the time. And so a four-step process of activating those cytotoxic cells, as well as getting some of those helper T cells too.
Now, why we care about some of those memory T cells is one, memory T cells will hang out in our immune system for months, if not years. I'm like, it's not always forever, but sometimes, and I'm like, it can be for an extremely long period of time. And those memory T cells will wake up and immediately become functional as soon as they have that epitope, antigen, and I'm like, MHC complex mix again. As long as that MHC antigen on one of our cells is presenting the epitope that originally triggered them to go active, they'll go active. And they're going to have a, now a more effective response than the first time they responded. Again, they remembered how to kill these cells. And so they're going to be a lot faster than a lot of times that, you know, for certain um, intracellular pathogens, we become immune to these things now because it kills them off before we even know that we are ever infected. However, we need a little regulation with our T cells. Mostly because our T cells can get a little crazy and start to respond to our self um, and our autoantigens on our body cells and start to kill them. So normally our T cells do require an additional signal from antigen presenting cell whether they should respond or not. Whether this is something we actually need to kill or whether this is something we can kind of sit on. And so our regulatory T cells are really helping moderate our cytotoxic T cell activity so they don't kill normal body cells any more than we would ever have to. So I'm like, that's, you know, getting all of our T cells. Now, as I said before, we have our two branches. We have our, immu our humoral immunity with B cells, and we have our cell-mediated immunity with our T cells. However, the two branches can work together. There are two ways that her, our humoral immunity gets activated. The one we've already really talked about, we did that the other class period. And I'm like, and it's called just a T-independent antibody immunity, which means there's no help with T cells whatsoever. It's just the humoral branch doing its own thing with its B cells doing its own thing. So it's just a humoral immune response mounted against a pathogen directly. No T cells interacting, no T cells talking whatsoever with the humoral branch. Now, this can be great, and I'm like, we usually are going to have some type of T independent antigens they can recognize, meaning nothing a T cell would recognize. Um, it's a really fast way we can get rid of a pathogen, and I'm like, but it is a weak immune response, and then the antibodies that are made go away really quickly. And I'm like, so we can get rid of these things, but then the antibodies are gone. And our immune system doesn't retain those antibodies. And so there's little immunological memory, which means you can get infected with that same organism two weeks later. And it's like your immune system didn't remember a thing because it really didn't. And I'm like, it can get rid of the pathogen when you get infected. Great. It's gone. But then we're left with no immune response. And so I'm like, it's got its benefits, getting rid of the thing quickly, but then there's just no memory. And so that's if, you know, there's no T cell interaction. However, we also have our T helper dependent humoral immune response. Now, our cell mediated branch is now talking to our humoral branch. Now, there's a lot of stuff going on here. And again, if I had my board, I would just draw a quick little arrow and I will uh, so you can see how this all interacts. I'll review with this, but we're going to activate our T helper cells just like normal. We would normally, you know, we would present, we've got our CD4 cells, we've got an epitope, we've got that MHC2. We are going to activate T helper cells. We've got it. Now our T helper cells may realize, because I said, one of the things that T helper cells do is help monitor B cells. If our T helper cells think that we need our antibodies to kill a pathogen, that it's not something we can just kill it with cytotoxic cells, we need antigens to help this out. The T helper cell is going to differentiate into what we call a T helper 2 cell. I just call it a T helper cell 2.0, which is version 2.0. And the T helper cell is going to activate a B cell. So the B cell is not activated because it saw an antigen. That B cell is activated because the T helper 2.0 cell told it it needs to become activated. And same thing, when you go to the humor immune response, you activate a B cell, 
We start making plasma cells. We can start making memory cells. And I'm like, oops, and I'm like, but those plasma cells are gonna turn out antibodies. This is our same basic thing. Activated B cells, plasma cells, memory cells, turning out antibodies. Except the main difference is that these B cells were activated by a T helper cell and not the actual pathogen itself. Now, there's a benefit by doing it this way. And I'm like, this is just showing kind of the steps. We activate T helper cells, become those 2.0 T helper 2 cells, T helper 2 cells, activate B cells. There we go. Now, it's the memory B cells that are made when we do this process. These memory B cells are a little bit better than just a regular old memory B cell. These memory B cells, and I'm like, are long-lived memory B cells. And I'm like, so they can activate and start turning out antibodies a whole lot faster and they can stick around for years instead of just a few days or a couple weeks. I'm like, they themselves don't secrete antibodies, but yes, they can get triggered to become plasma cells and then start turning out antibodies. And I'm like, and they'll do that as soon as that antigen is ever encountered again in the body. And so I'm like, we're, we're making better memory cells. We can still get rid of the pathogen. And I'm like, but now we've got a better, better memory B cell that's gonna stick around for a lot longer. Now, this is showing um, how this is actually working. And I'm like, with the tetanus shot. So I'm like, once you get a tetanus shot, you are exposing your immune system to some type of antigen. And I'm like, and for tetanus, it's the toxin, not the actual bacteria, that's the bad part. And I'm like, but it could take a week before we even start to see the first antibody. And it could take a couple weeks before we even start to see a second antibody. So it takes a couple weeks before our immune system even starts to churn out antibodies. However, and I'm like, this particular toxin it will trigger the T helper cells to activate a B cell. Our B cells themselves are not going to get activated right away. Um, it's the T helper cells that will tell our B cells that, hey, you should wake up. We've just been exposed to some type of toxoid. And I'm like, we need to start making antibodies. And then we have memory cells, long lasting memory cells. And so if you ever are exposed to the tetanus toxin, you can mount a huge immune response a lot faster, a stronger immune response. And within a matter of days versus weeks. And I'm like, so we've got these long lasting memory cells. Now, just talking tetanus, these memory cells don't last forever. There's the reason why they want you to get booster shots every eight to 10 years for the tetanus toxin. Some of those memory B cells go away. And so you get that booster shot to kind of wake up your immune system, start churning out more of those memory cells so that if you ever are exposed to the tetanus toxin, you're ready to go, you've got a strong immune system, lots and lots of memory cells. Now, the fact that we can remember our, we've all of these memory B cells, it's called an anamnestic response. Now, if you think of the word, I like to break the words apart. If we, you know, put a little line right here. When you think of amnesia, amnesia is forgetting. When you put an, or even just a at the beginning of something, it means without or not. So this means not forgetting, response, aka remembering. If you don't forget, it's because you remembered. So this is the remembering response. We can remember things now. We've got memory against all these different types of toxins. Now, I do have this little YouTube video clip on Blackboard. It's brown, I think about a 15 minute, maybe just under review overall of the immune system, the different parts of our innate immune system, our first line of defense, our second line of defense, and then our adaptive immune response with our humoral immunity branch and its B cells and our cell mediated branch with helper T cells and regulatory T cells and cytotoxic T cells. And I'm like, it's a nice little review. So if you sat in lecture or even listened to this thing and the whole time you were like, I have no idea what she just got done saying, it might be another little clip to help refresh your memory, memory and kind of put things together. So it is on YouTube. You can take a look at that if you'd like. Now, kind of one of my last slides and I'm like is 
yes, we can remember things, aka we now could start to acquire immunity against things. And we're going to talk more about the immune system and how we can make ourselves have a strong immune system um, in our next lecture, but different types of acquired immunity that we can get. Now, there are two types. There's a naturally acquired immunity and an artificially acquired immunity. Naturally acquired immunity is a response against antigens that are encountered in your everyday life. So you go about your everyday life, you go to work, you go to school, you've got kids that bring stuff home from, you know, any random disease and sickness they bring home. You've got lots of things that your immune system has to encounter on an everyday life. And it mounts an immune response and some of those things you will develop immunity to. And I'm like, that's all naturally acquired. And I'm like, the more things you expose to your body, the more, the stronger your immune system is, you're going to have more memory cells. Artificially acquired immunity is a response to antigens that were introduced via a vaccine. So these are things you were not exposed to going about your everyday life, but we're going to expose our immune system to some of these antigens, you know, non-toxic, you know, we somehow damage them so they can't cause us harm, but uh, we're going to expose our body to these antigens so that we can then develop antibodies against it. So in case we are exposed to them in our everyday life, we don't get sick from them. Now, one of my little questions that I usually ask in lecture, I poll, and so I'm curious, and I'll, I'll probably poll you in lecture if I forget, remind me too. And I'm like, that usually it's about a half and half split. And I'm like, that about half of the class, and we'll see, about half of the class has a naturally acquired immunity to chicken pox, and the other half of the class has an artificially acquired immunity to chicken pox. Naturally acquired means you actually got chicken pox at some point in your life. You developed memory cells against it so that you shouldn't, it's not always 100%, you shouldn't get it again. Artificially acquired is because you had the chicken pox vaccine so that you don't get the chicken pox. Also, still not 100%, but you do have a strong immune system against it. Now, with either of these types of, uh, either of these types of immunity, the way our immune system works for developing this immunity is we're either going to have an active immune response or a passive immune response against these. An active immune response it just means that you made the antibodies yourself. Your immune system made antibodies. They saw antigens, whether it was encountered in everyday life or whether it was a vaccine, but you made antibodies. A passive immune response means you have immunity against something because you were given the antibodies. So you have antibodies in your body that you were never given or you were that you never made, but you were just given the antibodies. So you were made somewhere else. Example is in breast milk. An infant can have antibodies in their body. They never made. They were made in mom and mom gave that baby those antibodies. Another example is antivenom. And I'm like, because there's a reason why we would give someone antibodies. And a big example case is with a snake bite. And I'm like, yep, the snake bite venom, our immune system can recognize snake bite venom. And I'm like, it can activate B cells. They can turn into plasma cells. We can churn out antibodies and we can neutralize snake bite venom. But that could take two weeks, if not longer. And usually after you get bitten by a snake, you don't have two weeks. And so we need to get those antibodies into a body extremely fast. And so that's when you'd be given antibodies. It's, you know, some type of a shot, but you'd be given that antivenom. So that's another, you know, and I'm like, way. And we'll talk about where they make those antibodies as well that you may be given. And I'm like, this in your book is table 16.4 is just showing you examples of naturally acquired immunity versus artificially acquired immunity and active immune responses you know, making, you're making antibodies versus passive that you're given antibodies uh, from somewhere else. So that's the end of this PowerPoint. We'll do a quick little review on it, just showing how the two branches of the system uh, moderate with each other, but hopefully that made kind of sense. <laughs>